thanks everybody. Um, I can't see people on Zoom, so I'll, if something goes wrong, please let somebody know and I'm uh, hope, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so today, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invite to speak. I'm going to be talking about small but mighty volcanoes or cinder cones and mar craters. Let's see if I can get this one. So just a little outline. I'm not going to focus entirely on the boring volcanic field because Darlene here is going to be the one who's going to be sorting out a lot of the boring for us, but I'll give you an overview to what we're interested in in the boring volcanic field, what we know about it so far, and then I'm going to present a couple projects about how I do research projects on these sorts of volcanoes. But backing up a little, I'll give an introduction to the Cascade Arc, why we have volcanoes here in the first place. And then I'll introduce monogenetic volcanoes. That term is kind of coming out of fashion because it turns out that mono meaning one, these sometimes these volcanoes have more than one eruption or exhibit a diversity of magma types and eruption styles. So people are interested in changing that name. So I'll highlight some of their eruption styles and hazards introduce you to why the Cascades is a fantastic place to look at monogenetic volcanoes, and then go into some of my research projects. Okay, so this is probably a review for most of you, but um, let's see, do I push the middle button for the, or is it upper right for the pointer? Uh, push the center button for the- there. Oh, there it is, okay. So we live in the, in the Cascade, just uh, west of the Cascade Arc, and arcs globally are produced by subduction of an oceanic plate beneath another plate. In our case, it's the sinking of the Juan de Fuca and Gorda microplates um, to the north, northeast beneath the North American continent. And when that happens, the oceanic crust here that has been altered by ocean water, it has seafloor sediments on top of it. The water that's in those components is released into the mantle and it causes the mantle to melt. Those melts rise up and they can erupt in a volcanic arc. And because this process is happening all along subduction zones, you get this resulting chain of volcanoes that's lined up roughly parallel to where the plate is subducting. So in our neck of the woods, we have these lovely, I've highlighted some of the larger stratovolcanoes or composite volcanoes that make up the Cascade Arc, but it turns out we have a lot of other volcanoes as well. So I really love this figure that came out a couple years ago from O'Hara, a student of uh, Leif Karlstrom's at University of Oregon. And it shows an a long arc look. Uh, it's a little dark, but these little dots in here are all the vents and the little white circles are all of the um, major edifices in the volcanic arc. And the interesting thing to note is that there are places like around Sisters and Newberry where you have a lot of vent density, lots of volcanoes in a very small area. And so they've broken out as you go along the arc with latitude, the number of vents and what kind of volcanic vent they are. So you'll notice up near um, Seattle, near Mount Rainier, you basically have one vent, you have Rainier and it's a composite volcano. Um, but you'll notice there are a couple places in the arc where there are a lot of these cinder cone vents. Ooh, my screen just went blank. Is that what the dark dots are on the map? Yeah, the little red dots on the map are supposed to be red. Um, but yes, those are each individual vents. Okay. And so you can see this big swath of vents across here. Yeah. My computer keeps going black and I hope it does not die. Okay. So again, there are a couple of really interesting places along the arc where we have a lot of these cinder cone volcanoes. So if we look at a, an area of the high cascades that I'm really um, fond of, the area south of the Sisters and Bachelor, and here's Newberry, you can't um, see much other than those big features in the satellite image, and you can see those four composite volcanoes. But if we look at a terrain map, which is derived from uh, Dogami's LIDAR data, you can all of a sudden see all of these little dots, and each one of those is a single cinder cone volcano. If you added them up, there are literally hundreds of cinder cone volcanoes in this image between this chain coming off Bachelor, we have a bunch of cinder cones up here and all of these surrounding Newberry. There's another major field north of the sisters up here. So by number, these are dominantly the type of volcano we have in central Oregon. And I really like this view if you've driven over Mackenzie Pass, you're heading down to sisters this way and you're looking off to the south at the sisters cluster here. Actually, some of the youngest stuff in this image are these are monogenetic volcanoes. So I just want to highlight a few of them and their ages because in terms of what 
kinds of eruptions we've had in the recent, in recent geologic past in Oregon, it's these types of eruptions. So Belknap is basically below us that produces all these flows here, and Belknap erupted somewhere between 3,000 and 1,000 years ago. Twin craters, which is off this image here, is another 3,000 to about 2,300 years ago. Yapoa crater is up here and produced these lovely flows coming down this way about 2,000 years ago. Four in one cone is a series of little cinder cones and spatter vents that produce these flows 2,300 to 1,500 years ago. And Collier cone up here produced a very long lava flow about 1,600 years ago. So it's pretty clear that there was a lot going on between about 3,000 and 1,500 years ago, just in this image. And that doesn't include all of the other vents in that area. The other thing I want to point out is at least for the Cascades monogenetic volcanoes, most of them erupt a magma that's basaltic. So low silica, higher magnesium, higher iron. Um, this means they're pretty fluid, hot, runny lavas, similar to Hawaii, Hawaii type eruptions in composition, um, but they have a little higher silica content. The only one of those that didn't do that in this picture is Collier Cone, which erupted a, an andesite to sort of dacite composition at the end. There are also a few um, obsidian flows sort of on the flanks of South Sister, and obsidian flows and, and rhyolite domes can also be considered monogenetic volcanoes. They just aren't as abundant, especially here. Okay, so now that we've had a look at what monogenetic volcanoes look like, let's look at the three major types. So overall, monogenetic volcanoes are the most common volcanic landform on Earth. Um, they're typically pretty small in volume, um, and as their name suggests, they often erupt just once, but we're starting to learn that that's not always the case. <clears throat> their eruptions are, are often very short, on the order of three days. I think the Ukenrek uh, Mars eruption in Alaska in the 70s was about seven days long. Typically, they can erupt for months. If we think about the Cumbre Vieja eruption in the Canary Islands last a couple years ago, that went on up for a few months. More rarely, in the case of Pericutine, it erupted for nine years, which if you imagine a cinder cone erupting for nine years near Bend, that's a pretty bad scenario. Um, Emily, can yeah. interrupt just a second? Somebody is reminding uh, to have you press the shift key occasionally so the computer doesn't... Is it, is it blanking on them? I haven't seen it, but I think maybe someone okay. has. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll just move. Maybe I'll use the mouse to then folks online can see me pointing to. Might be better to use the mouse to. Yeah. Nope, yeah. oh, it's just went black on me and I didn't do anything. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll keep an eye on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, like Sheila was mentioning, the, the trouble from a hazards perspective about preparing for these sorts of eruptions is we don't know where they're going to come up. So if there's unrest near Mount Hood or Mount um, St. Helens, we know pretty much where the lava is going to make it to the surface. In the case of these monogenetic volcanoes, they erupt where there was no vent previously. And in the case of Pericotine, it erupted in a, um, a farmer's cornfield in the middle of his <laughs> corn plantation. So that's a real challenge in trying to understand what these eruptions can do. So these are the three end members of uh, typical monogenetic volcanoes. So we've got scoria cones or cinder cones is the other, same word. They're basically a, a conical buildup of scoria, cinders, blocks, and bombs that get ejected from the volcano from anything from mildly explosive, explosive to, to very explosive eruptions. And then at the other end of things in terms of process, we have what are called Mars. This little um, conical depression beneath them is called a diatreme. But Mar craters are an explosion crater that happens when small volumes of magma on the way to the surface interact with water. So it could be a fully saturated water system, it could be an aquifer, it could be a shallow lake. But when that happens, you get this explosion pit and it blasts out this big crater, many of them fill with water, and they often have these low slope deposits on the sides of them. And the tough cone is basically somewhere in between these two. There's a little phreatomagmatic component to tough cones. They blast out larger craters, but they also have a larger cone. Oop, and the screen went dead again. Um, uh, so they have a, a slightly larger cone than a mar. And so the other problem with monogenetic volcanoes, not only do we not know where the next one's going to erupt, we don't know exactly what their eruption style is going to be. When we prepare for eruptions at St. Helens, for example, we look at its past behavior to figure out what we think is most likely for it to do next. If we don't even know where the vent's going to be, we don't have a clue what these are going to do. Is it going to come up and interact with water and we're going to have a big explosion? 
or is it going to form a little cinder cone? How long is that eruption going to last? These are all things we just can't know ahead of time. So I just wanted to illustrate um, the importance of external water in creating these sorts of mar volcanoes because I'm going to talk a fair bit about those today. Um, don't worry too much about the how much energy is released, etc., on this. But the key is that when magma it rises to the surface and it interacts with this uh, external water, if there's the right ratio of water to magma, you can ex um, have a very large explosion that flashes that water to steam. And wherever, if that depth is shallow enough, it's going to blow out everything above it. So big blocks of rocks are going to be ejected. If you have too much water, so if you have a high water to magma mass ratio, you're going to have enough pressure on that system that's going to contain that explosion. You really won't happen. You're going to have, say, pillow lavas erupting in the deep ocean. But this is sort of the sweet spot in terms of water to magma mass ratios for having that big phreatomagmatic um, crater evacuated. Oops. So what does this look like in terms of a process um, as that magma is rising to the surface in a dike? Uh, it intersects, say, the water table, and that is where the explosion is going to happen. So depending on that depth, that's essentially going to scale to the depth of the eventual crater that gets blown out here on the right. So these can form through a series of explosions. It's not usually just one. And the eventual crater diameter and crater depth are dependent on how deep those explosions are happening and how many of them are and if they're moving around in space um, as that dike is rising to the surface. And I highly recommend if you ever want to look at cool geology and cool experiments, the folks at Buffalo are constantly blowing things up in their, these crazy furnaces they have outside. They're pouring molten rocks down their drive or on the snow and ice in the middle of winter to see what happens. It's really, they have some really cool um, magma water interaction experiments. Okay, so next I just want to walk through some examples of what we know these eruptions are like. These are our best guesses for what future eruptions would be like. And of course, I always turn to Parikutin. It's my favorite volcano. And I got to work on it for my PhD, which was amazing. Um, so in terms of Parikutin, again, it was an anomaly in how long it erupted. Nine years from 1943 to 1952. Because it was so recent, it was really well documented. Um, both Mexican geoscientists and scientists from the Smithsonian went down and watched this thing build from absolutely nothing to what it is today. Um, again, most cinder cones or eruptions are on the order of days to months. So when an eruption like this happens, it produces a range of different deposits. So first off, if you have a very explosive eruption like Pericotine, you're gonna be forming a big tephra blanket from these high um, explosive eruption columns. So Pericotine was unusual, I mean, you can see the cone here, and it's dwarfed by the size of its eruption column. The columns went up to 20,000 feet, which for a cinder cone eruption is huge. And there was fine ash fall on Mexico City, some hundreds of kilometers away. So this was a very large, very explosive eruption. And before Pericotine, we really didn't know that was possible. We didn't know cinder cones could be so explosive. So when this column is produced and ash and scoria are raining out from it, it produces these beds of tephra and ash. Um, and that's what there's, that's me and a colleague, Laura Pioli, working on these, this tephra blanket around Pericotine. So these are produce their own challenges in terms of hazard to local communities. Um, additionally, at Pericotine, we saw that cinder cones can have explosive eruptions like this shown here and a lava flow coming out simultaneously. So both explosive and effusive eruptions at the same time. So lava flows, of course, are another product. And then the cone itself is built up out of, again, nothing. Um, for Pericutine, the cone building was really rapid at the beginning of the eruption. And it went from absolutely nothing to its final height of about a thousand feet in, in about three months, I think. Would you like that in your backyard? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So on the other end, sorry, my screen just keeps blanking on me. I don't know if there's anything I can do to... It's been like that for a while. It's like that? Okay, yeah. I'll just ignore it. So in terms of free magmatic eruptions, these are a few of the vis, uh, recently viewed free magmatic eruptions. And you can see they look pretty different. So these two in particular um, are erupting through water. This is an offshore eruption of Japan, and it's erupting through a shallow sea. And you can see these jets of material being shot into the sky. 
and then these clouds of, of hot ash and gas kind of flowing out over. They make sort of small pyroclastic density currents as all this water is entrained into the magma and the magma is fragmented to really fine ash. The same thing happened in Ruapehu in New Zealand in 1980. And in this case, the rising magma interacted with a lake at the top of the volcano and erupted through that. And the most recent um, Mar forming eruption that we've really seen start to finish was Ukenrek Mars in Alaska, it erupted for about a week in 1977 and produced both more magmatic sort of classical explosive eruptions and phreatomagmatic eruptions. And these are what the deposits of a classic phreatomagmatic eruption look like. Um, this is a picture I took at Kilburn Hole Mar Crater in southern New Mexico, one of the largest Mars um, in the US. And these deposits look very different than what I showed you from Pericutine. So these are beds of surge deposits. So these are the layer deposits formed when that external water gets sort of sucked into the, this mixture of gas and ash coming out of the volcano and it flows over the ground surface. These deposits are emplaced very wet. And I don't know if you can see, there's a little bomb here. Oh, yikes. It's really not liking this. Okay, there we go. There's a little block here that was uh, kind of ejected out of the, the crater and then impacted these surge deposits and they deformed plastically because they were so wet. It just sort of splatted into this deposit. So surge deposits are a characteristic of phreatomagmatic eruptions. Um, the ejection of huge blocks and bombs because this explosion is blasting out all of the bedrock that's above wherever that explosion is taking place at depth. Um, and again, another picture of that Ruapehu. So another um, hazard non-unique to cinder cone eruptions, but that should not be uh, forgotten is uh, gases. So we saw this most recently in the Cumbrae Vieja eruption in 2021. Um, and this is showing the gas that was picked up by a satellite in an area over several hundreds of kilometers. So this scale bar is 250 kilometers. And you can see high amounts of sulfur dioxide that are up in the atmosphere, sort of trending off towards Portugal and Spain. Um, particularly for basaltic eruptions, things like Jaruyo and Pericutine, they cranked out a lot of sulfur. Um, and so we would expect we'd have some acid rain and bog downwind of these volcanoes as well. So we, I've mentioned again, the hazard of ash and scoria from these eruptions. Here's an up close look again at those deposits from Pericutine. Near the vent, we're talking six, seven meters of this stuff raining down on uh, the communities nearby. And we saw that last year again at, at Cumbre Vieja. And, and by December of 2021, the nearby village was covered in this really fine ash and tephra. So um, this is a, a severe threat to the nearby uh, communities. Uh, lava flows, can't forget about the hazards of lava flows, although they are easier to get away from, they will inundate the areas around the volcano. And you can see Pericotine and the cone itself is quite large, but it's dwarfed by the size of the lava flow field around it that extends some um, greater than five kilometers from the cone. And these flows buried the nearby village and folks had to get um, moved to a new community and develop a new community after this eruption. Similarly at Cumbre Vieja, again, I love this image from the European uh, Space Agency of the, the lava flow coming out of the vent and snaking all the way more than six kilometers to the ocean. Okay, so that was our overview of monogenetic volcanoes broadly. So let's go back and look at some of the monogenetic volcanoes close to home. We're gonna start with uh, the region around us, the boring volcanic field, which is sort of responsible for all of these vents in this little area over here. So I really love this map from Fleck et al., one of the um, research groups who have studied the boring volcanic field. And here you can see all of the vents throughout the Cascade arc. And then the big anomaly is really the boring volcanic field, which is far westward of the rest of the, the arc chain. St. Helens is also west of the, the main thread of the Cascade arc, but the boring uh, volcanic field is really kind of an anomaly. So I am I know someone's gonna ask me why it's there. And I, as many papers as I've read, as many people that I've talked to, everyone sort of goes, eh? Um, <laughs> there are a lot of questions about where, why it is where it is. 
Some have to do with perhaps rotation of the Oregon block that's opening up something in the Portland Basin. There are other ideas about intrusion of magma beneath the arc, flexing the crust and creating this brittle zone of weakness out beneath Portland. But no one's really sure is the honest answer. It is really an odd uh, location for all these volcanoes. And they have weird compositions too that don't really match the volcanoes of the Cascades. They don't really match anything else for that matter. So I don't have a great answer for why the boring field is where it is. Not boring. It's not boring. But it is na named after boring because it's the sort of central community to all of the boring volcanic fields. So the map on the right, all of these sort of peachy fields are the areas that are covered in boring lavas and or tephras or vents. Um, all of the little symbols on here are different vents or samples from the study by Hagstrom et al. in 2017. And the purple units are things that are flowing in from the Cascade Arc. So we have everything from Larch Mountain as part of the Boring Volcanic Field, up through Carson and to Pyramid Rock, lots of vents around Washougal and Camas, across to sort of beyond um, Forest Park and way to the south of by the Clackamas River. So they really extend over a, a wide region of the Portland Basin. And I like this plot on the left. Don't worry about the different um, paleomag ages, but just focus on the, the range of ages for all of the boring lavas that have been dated so far. Uh, so it seems like activity here started up about 3.2 million years ago, and it started off with kind of a whimper, not a whole lot of activity at first. Uh, there was another little pulse of activity around two and a half million years ago, and then it kind of calms down for a bit. Then around 1 to 0 0.5 MA, there was a big pulse of eruptions in the boring volcanic field. Another little pause, and then a big uptick in volcanism between about 200 and 100,000 years ago. So there seem to be three main pulses of volcanism. Um, interestingly, though, the youngest eruptions are 58,000 years ago, not that old. And there are a few eruptions that are 75, 90,000 years as well. So I'm going to show some of those ages. This is a map I compiled using the Fleck et al. data. Um, I put it into GeoMap app, and I've colored. I hope those show up. So the smaller the, the symbol and the darker it is, the older it is. So all of these little dark circles here, they're small. Those are the sort of three million year old stuff. As you get to a medium gray and a slightly larger symbol, you're getting into that one to two million year old. And then by the time you get to these larger white circles, you're looking at things that are less than about 200,000 years old. And so the conclusion from their paper is that if you draw sort of a trend line through all the three million year old stuff, you get something that's trending kind of north, northeast, south, southwest. Same thing for this, you know, 200, but it kind of steps to the north. And then for the 200 to 100, it kind of steps further north still. So they suggested there was a vague northward progression over time of activity in the boring volcanic field. So I want to show you a, a few of these locations. If you didn't know they were boring volcanics before, you will now, and you can go check them out. So the first one is Battleground Lake Mar. So it's up here in Battleground is a state park. Um, it's a little dark on the screen, but you can see there's a gorgeous Mar crater. So the rising magma hit the water table and exploded and made this huge, or not huge, but a very nice deep round circular lake. And it has a little buildup of deposits around um, the rim. And Darlene has been there and is gonna be looking at that one. And Battleground Lake is only about 108,000 years old. So geologically speaking, reasonably young. The youngest thing though in the boring volcanic field is Beacon Rock. And to look at it, you certainly would not know that. It looks extremely eroded. But the reason that it looks eroded is because the Missoula floods ripped down the Columbia and tore out all the scoria that was around it. So if you can imagine putting a bunch of scoria and cinders and making a nice little cinder cone sitting on the edge of the Columbia, that's what it originally looked like. The Missoula floods washed away all that erodible stuff, and all that's left is this the solidified sort of conduit system to that volcano. And so that is about 58,000 years old. And finally, um, Portland is unique for being the only city to have two dormant volcanoes within city limits, so very exciting. Uh, Rocky Butte, they've had a hard time dating, so the best constraint they could get is less than 134,000 years. They think it's probably somewhere around there, um, but that one's actually a little bit younger than Mount Tabor, which is 208,000 years.
So I don't want to give away everything you guys are going to do on the field trip. And Darlene will probably be taking you to this awesome outcrop. If you go to the parking lot at Mount Tabor and you go by the basketball fields, maybe you have seen this outcrop where they've excavated into what used to be a cinder cone. So if you look over here, you can kind of get the sense of these dipping beds of scoria and bombs. And if you go up closer and look at it, those are my kiddos for scale, you can see just a gorgeous dipping scoria. And at that place, you're basically standing inside what was once a cinder cone and they've just excavated the rest away. So really cool deposits from that one. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the rest of the research uh, on the boring lavas to Darlene, but I'll tell you about the kinds of things I'm interested in doing on um, and how we study these sorts of volcanoes and what we can learn about them um, and prepare for future eruptions. So some of the research questions that I'm really interested in are, again, from a hazards perspective, where were magmas stored before eruption? Is that gonna be something that we could see, say, geophysically, if there's an injection of magma into the crust, could we pick that up? Do we have a sense of what depth we need to be looking at? Um, how long were they stored? Do we have a sense of what's the run up to these eruptions gonna look like? Are we gonna have a lot of warning or are we gonna have very little warning? Um, how and why the compositions of magmas change before and during the eruption is important because magma composition affects eruption style. How fast did the magmas ascend to the surface? We'll look at this a little bit today. And um, again, important for from a hazards perspective, if we start to get earthquakes and some tremor, do we know how long we have before that magma could make it to the surface? One thing that's a big unknown for a lot of these young basaltic eruptions in the Cascades is what is their age? When did they erupt? Um, a lot of that stuff I showed at like Santium and Mackenzie Pass, those have been pretty well dated, but there are a lot of basalts out there that have not been dated. They are hard to date. The, their age is too young. They don't have a lot of potassium. They're lousy for argon dating. There isn't a lot of vegetation in some of these systems. So we don't have a lot of carbon. So it's a challenge to figure out how old they are. And kind of the holy grail of a lot of this research that we don't have the great answer to is how long do these eruptions last? I mean, if we know they could be anything from days to a decade, boy, we'd really like to know that if we could figure out um, what that answer is. And finally, looking at changes in eruption style, both in a single eruption and between eruptions to be able to say, okay, the likelihood of an eruption doing this type of thing is higher than it exhibiting this sort of behavior. So how do I answer these questions? Um, I use a lot of geochemistry and a fair bit of field work is the short answer. So in my little cartoon here of a volcano um, and my magmatic system, I have a magma that's rising through the crust and it's stalling for a little bit and cooling and crystallizing. When these minerals crystallize, they can trap a tiny bit of that melt inside of them. And that's called a melt and inclusion. And that little melt inclusion is preserved. And if it's erupted and quenched quickly, it's turned into a glass. And I can analyze that glass and find out what was happening at this place, at depth beneath the volcano before it erupted. So these are some um, real melt inclusions that I've analyzed. These are from Blue Lake. And this is the glass now. It has a little bubble in it. Here's another couple melt inclusions. And it's all enclosed inside this olivine crystal that I polished. And I've intersected that glass to, to analyze its composition. So I like these analyses because I get a bunch of little snapshots about magma composition over time, and I can get at those pre-eruptive gases. By the time this magma gets to the surface, the gases are basically out and gone and no longer dissolved inside the melt, so I can't analyze them that way. The minerals themselves tell us a whole lot about what was going on at depth too. We can use the mineral zoning to look at how things are changing as that mineral grows, kind of like the growth rings of a tree. And we can also use their compositions to get at storage pressures and temperatures and ascent time scales using diffusion chronometry. I do also a lot of field work. So using those uh, using those products, um, eruptive products, I'm doing a lot of mapping, measuring the thickness of the deposits, sampling them, trying to figure out their eruption style, how widely they're distributed around the vent. I'm looking at changes within the eruption stratigraphy from base to top to see if I can figure out anything about how the eruption intensity is changing or the style is changing. And I can also analyze the glass and little um, bits of scoria that get chucked out to, to see if I can track those changing melt compositions too. Okay, so we're gonna look at two different studies. Um, 
We've got twin lakes here in the south. I guess I like volcanoes that are also lakes and then Blue Lake up here in the north. So these sort of are on both sides of the sisters cluster where there are a lot of these um, monogenetic vents. So we're gonna start in the south with twin lakes and then end with the Blue Lake research. So twin lakes is something you might look at again on satellite with a satellite image and go, yeah, okay, there's a couple you know, lakes there. They're probably those mar craters and maybe there's something going on up here. But if you turn to better um, uh, terrain-based imagery, you can start to see, okay, there are actually quite a few vents here. So we have a series of mar craters, one, two, three here. And then we have this big um, vent here that has multiple vents coming out of it and a couple of few cinder cones up here. So you start to get a sense that this is a, a more complicated area than maybe at first glance. So this map is sort of the compilation. I've been working in this area for the last couple of years and spent a couple of field seasons out there. So I mapped out the deposit boundaries from each of these different vents, both using the LIDAR from Dogami, which has been extremely helpful. This area is fairly vegetated as you saw in that last image. And then also field checking, going out and looking at some of these contacts and trying to figure out where they came from. So kind of working our way from south to north, it looks like based on the age relationships and overlapping relationships at the deposits that the eruption started in the south and generally migrated towards the north over time. So the first few eruptions down here produced these series of mar craters. Their south twin lake has a nice campground on it. Um, north twin lakes is a, actually two sort of nested mar craters and their deposits are shown in these sort of blue colors down here. Uh, north of that, there's a mar crater that that's then been filled in by younger deposits. So there's some lava flows coming off of this little cinder cone here and these lava flows that come in and kind of fill into that uh, mar crater. So we know that one's older than all of these. In the middle of this broad structure that's got a few vents is called Shookash Butte. And it's actually a lot more complicated in the field. It's a series, there's a cinder cone here, a big tough cone on top of that. And then there's this broad round deposit here and these lava flows coming out. Um, the last two eruptions in the sequence were Wuxi Butte here and Palinish Butte, which is actually two little cinder cones and they produce substantial lava flows. So all in all, there's about 10 vents, depending on how many of these you subdivide out as separate little cones. And the deposits cover about 10 kilometers north to south and up to about four kilometers east to west. And their total area that they cover is about 30 square kilometers. So I'm going to walk through and show you, give you sort of a visual tour if you were there. And I highly recommend checking out some of these places because they're just gorgeous. If we're walking from south to north along the, the chain, what are the kinds of things you would see from these volcanoes? So stop one on the south side of South Twin Lake is... Uh, yeah, so sorry, the Deschutes River runs right here. Let me go back up. So this is Crane Prairie Reservoir, this big gray kind blob. Of, uh, They're basically west, west of Lapine. Of, uh, yeah, there. yes. Yes, yeah, so the Deschutes flows out of Crane Prairie, goes through here, and then this is Wikiup Reservoir down to the south. So South Twin Lake, the deposits are entirely surges. So this looks a lot like what I showed you from, from uh, Kilburn Hole. There's nothing else, no lava flows, no scoria fall. It's just all surges and bombs that have impacted those surge deposits. So this was a purely phreatomagmatic eruption. And that was pretty much it. Those deposits from North Twin Lakes look to be about the same. And as we move northward up the, the chain, when we get to this, there's actually a buried cinder cone here that's been quarried, which is handy for me. And if you go into that quarry, you'll see this nice oxidized scoria cone here, but uh, it's buried by these yellowish deposits, which are actually coming from that big tough cone. And there are surges on top of this oxidized cinder cone. So this is an older sort of partially buried cinder cone beneath this broader big tough cone. And if we go look at the tough cone, it is spectacular. Up on the top here, there are about 20 meters of surges, just one on top of the other, this huge sequence. So there's my shovel for scale. Here's a huge bomb that got chucked out. Um, it's a really impressive sequence of surge deposits at the top. When I originally looked at this uh, area, I thought that this was going to be younger and that these surges must overlie this lava flow and the stuff coming out here. They are not present there. So this is older than this orange crater and these lava flows. 
Um, we have mapped this as a lava lake. So there was a pond of lava that came all the way up to the rim and then spilled over that side to the west and flowed out to the west. This is a massive lava flow that comes right up and over the side of this, this crater. And then finally, if you get to these cinder cones in the north, they are just your classic cute little cinder cone oxidized um, at Palinish Butte and really extensive, lovely lava flows. There's some nice lava tubes coming off the north side of Wuxi Butte as well. Okay, so let's look a little bit at their magma compositions. I know this looks really overwhelming, but I just want to show you kind of what we can do with the compositions that are erupted at these different volcanoes. Um, now that I know what the stratigraphy is and kind of the order of operations of what erupted first, we can look and see how magma composition changed or did not change over time. So I'm going to simplify this diagram in a minute, so don't worry about figuring out what everything is. It is color-coded to match the map on the right, though. So this is showing silica content and magnesium content. And I have whole rock samples, so like chunks of lava that I powdered up and analyzed, as well as glasses from melt inclusions and glasses from scoria. So I'm gonna go through and, and simplify this by showing, here's the whole rock data. You can't tell a whole heck of a lot from it, which is kind of a story with whole rock data. Um, the one thing that stands out is that the stuff from Palinish Butte, this yellow guy here, is a little higher in magnesium than the rest of this trend. It looks a little offset from the trend. If we walk through and look at all the glass compositions in order of how they erupted, I'm gonna show a bunch of fields on here for that, that range in compositions. So the thing to keep in mind as you're looking at these yes. is this is sort of the uh, degree of melt evolution or as the melt is evolving and crystallizing, it's gonna go up to higher silica and lower magnesium. So up here is more evolved, higher magnesium, lower silica is generally less evolved, closer to like a mantle melt. So this is the first stuff coming out of South Twin Lake. Then we have the stuff coming out of this guy here, this little lava flow that flows into the sort of middle uh, mar. You can see it's a little lower in magnesium and overall trends to higher silica. So the magma is kind of evolving a bit over time. Something starts to change as we get into that oxidized cinder cone. We have higher silica and about the same magnesium. But this is that yellow Palinish Butte is that sort of funny composition. And it does trend toward those higher magnesium contents. It doesn't show up as well in this plot, but if you look at the olivine compositions, they are very different from this cone too, and also higher in magnesium. So all of that together says, okay, that eruption suddenly got an influx of new more mafic magma. Uh, when that eruption started. And the last two, Wuxi Butte and Palinish Butte, go back to those just slightly more evolved compositions. So on the one hand, it wasn't maybe the, the huge excursions in composition I was ex hoping or expecting to see, but it was really interesting to think that all this stuff is like dominantly the same from 10 different vents over space, over time, and there's only a little excursion from that Palinish Butte. So that was pretty intriguing. And we're still looking at some of those data to see how much those compositions can tell us about where this stuff is coming from. I can't, I do have a few melt inclusion analyses that I can um, show that help us constrain those storage pressures. So where the magma was sitting before it erupted. Here's one of those melt inclusions and it's trapped in a, a little bit of olivine here. I've exposed it and I can analyze that glass. And the reason why water and CO2 are important is because like the carbon dioxide that's in our champagne or our soda, if it's pressurized, it can be dissolved in the magma. And how much CO2 and water you can dissolve in a magma depends on pressure. So this plot is showing um, carbon dioxide, CO2 in parts per million, and water in weight percent down here, and then two different ranges of pressure. So this is 100 megapascals all along this line, and this is 300 megapascals along that line. These are called isobars, lines of constant pressure. So the idea is that if you're a magma sitting at 100 MPa, well, you could have anything from zero weight percent water and 500 ppm CO2 to three weight percent water and zero ppm CO2. That's how much of those two components anywhere along the line is how much you could stuff in that magma and have it be dissolved at that pressure. If you increase pressure, you can dissolve more CO2 and more water, hence these higher pressures, higher water and CO2. So I analyzed melt, these melt inclusions from Twin Lake samples, and I found very low water, which was immediately unusual because this is an arc. Arcs are supposed to have a fair bit of water. 
Uh, globally, arc basalts have on average 4 weight percent water because of all that stuff that's getting subducted and released into the mantle causing melting. So these are a little unusual in that they have very low water. We're still working to constrain CO2. It's a little trickier to analyze because these have bubbles in them. But so far, it seems like they have around 1,000 to maybe 2,000 ppm CO2. So that puts us somewhere between about 200 and 300 megapascals is where these olivines are crystallizing um, at depth. And that equates to depths of about 7 to 11 kilometers um, below the surface. Those depths are very common for other basaltic magmas in the cascade. So that actually fits pretty well with where we think things are stalling out. And finally, what we did last summer, which was super fun, was to delve into paleomagnetism. I am not a paleomagnetist, so please like, don't ask me tons of questions. I'm just learning. But I went out with Cynthia Gardner and some other folks from the USGS, and we started doing some PMAG work. And the idea with looking at the paleomagnetic directions of the lava flows is that when the lava flow cools, all the magnetic minerals are going to solidify and align themselves to wherever magnetic north is at that time. We know magnetic north moves a lot. So knowing something about how magnetic north has been moving, having an estimate of the age, we can kind of look at that, that variation curve for our magnetic directions and get a sense of about what age we are. But most importantly, for a chain like this, we can sample a bunch of the different vents and compare them. If they all have the same paleomagnetic direction, we can say, okay, well, we know North has been moving like this, and it was moving about you know, quite a bit at this time, that means our eruptions had to be, occur over a short window. Or if we get lots of different directions, we can say, ah, okay, this was a long eruption. It took hundreds, maybe thousands of years as the pole was moving, the magnetic pole was moving. So that's kind of the idea of using PMAG to, to sort out these eruption ages-ish, and at least relative ages. For Twin Lakes, we had the benefit of knowing that on top of the Twin Lakes deposits, there's Mazama Tephra. So we know it's older than 7,700 years ago. And it sits on top of glacial till. So we know it's younger than about 15, 18,000. So we had that constraint to work with the PMAG, which was super helpful. So we just got these data back. Um, and so we're still refining the age a little bit, but it looks like um, the age of the Twin Lakes eruptions was about 14,000 years ago. And their paleomagnetic directions for all the samples we analyzed are identical. So based on how much the paleomag orientation was changing at that time, they had to erupt in less than 30 years. So all that stuff came out within about less than 30 years. The other thing that's super exciting about this result is the directions are almost the same as all of this stuff, all of Mount Bachelor and all the Bachelor chain and this red crater chain, they were all going off at around the same time. So that is a huge amount of volcanic activity in that place at a very short time window. Okay, so just to summarize what I've been doing at Twin Lakes and the kinds of things you can do in a, a chain like this. So we found out that the eruption began about 14,000 years ago and lasted for something less than 30 years. Um, the magma was water poor, but we know it stalled and crystallized somewhere around 7 to 11 kilometers depth before rising to the surface. The eruption started in the south and migrated to the north. Um, in the south, it was dominantly magma was interacting with water and forming these mar craters. In the center part of the chain, the eruptions were mixed. We had some water um, in affecting the rising magma and other places we didn't. The final two eruptions in the northern end were dry, they didn't interact with external water, and they formed cinder cones and extensive lava flows. Okay, is everybody ready for another one? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna go through Blue Lake and it's not as long, I didn't think as the Twin Lakes, but I wanna show some of the cool stuff I found at Blue Lake, in part because this is a fantastic um, eruption that may be one of the youngest in Oregon. We have not been able to date it. It does not have a lava flow. There is no carbon. I've done dug about 60 holes around Blue Lake and I've never found carbon. Um, what we do know, thankfully, about its age is that it, it overlies the ash that rained out from Sand Mountain. So there's Sand Mountain cinder cone chain is just to the west of Blue Lake. And that eruption has been dated really well at 3,000 years. So all we know is Blue Lake is less than 3,000. We're still trying to think of creative ways to get an age for it, but. Um, not yet. So here's Santium Highway, the Highway to Sisters around here. 
And this is Blue Lake. It's not a huge crater. It's only a few hundred meters across. It's very deep though, and it's really lovely. And it has this nice buildup of tephra around mainly the south and west sides. And it lies in this depression caused by the last glaciation, which formed Subtle Lake. So the Subtle Lake advance of glaciers carved out this deep valley here, uh, which produced Subtle Lake. And then Blue Lake just happened to erupt in that uh, valley. So if you go out to Blue Lake, you're not going to see lava flows, but you will see a lot of scoria and you're going to see lots of blocks and bombs, another phreatomagmatic eruption that chucked a lot of stuff out of the crater. If you walk around um, the rim here, there's a memorial park here. It's kind of hard to get into, but it's worth walking around if you can. Huge spindle bombs and other blocks and bombs were ejected. And the deposits are basically right at the surface. So you don't have to dig too much to get into the scoria from Blue Lake. But if you do, you'll see this nice um, layer of scoria. So it's not surge deposits. This isn't a, a mar that just had phreatomagmatic eruptions. You dig down and you see tons and tons of scoria and ash. Then you will eventually get to a surge deposit, that light layer shown there. There's a little more scoria, and then you've got the sand mountain ash at the bottom of that pit. So this is a much bigger hole that I dug. It's about a meter and a half deep. And this shows a little bit more detail about what was going on during the eruption. Um, and I wanna walk you through and show you how I sort of tease out the eruption style over time. So here at the very bottom, if you can see that is that sand mountain ash at the base. And then there's this very black, very dense fall deposit layer. So these are clasts that rained out of the sky. They aren't consolidated, um, but they're really dense and they're fairly fine grained. Those are overlain here in the strat column. You can see this blown up a little bit by a series of surge deposits. They're thin though. The surges, each individual surge is only a few centimeters thick. And then in between them are these little fall deposits of ash and scoria. But there's a sequence of surge deposits there. There's another layer of post -sur fall surge deposits that are also fairly dense. And then at the top of the section is the character of the deposits changes dramatically. The clasts get very big, they get very frothy. They're really vesicular, lightweight, they're full of bubbles. So something really changes here. And my interpretation after both looking at the deposits in the field and doing some um, componentry and sieving and density measurements of the clasts is that these initial phases here, this very dense fall deposit layer and these surge deposits were a time when we had a phreatomagmatic eruption. So the, the rising magma intersected the water table, blew out all this dense stuff, and then produced surge deposits, probably excavated the, the lake or the crater where the lake is now. And then so there was a transition. The water uh, probably dried up. The conduit sort of burns off the water as it's rising. And then the, the eruption switches to something that was probably much more like a scoria cone forming eruption. So just to show you what that looks like in terms of the distribution of the deposits in map form. So now we're looking down, here's Blue Lake, here's Subtle Lake, and here's US-20 curving around towards Sisters. And each one of these uh, white circles is a place where I dug a pit and measured the thickness of the deposits. So this deposit was 36 centimeters, this was 50, and so on. It was a lot of digging. <laughs> Um, and so what I've shown on here are these isopack lines. So these are lines of constant thickness. I've tried to contour the deposits to where the deposits are zero. That's important to know where do they end, 25 centimeters, 50 centimeters, et cetera. I could not ever get to the bottom in these locations that have greater than. Um, the initial deposit gets really coarse and it just chucked out blocks and bombs that are about yay big and I couldn't get through it. I needed a backhoe and that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> So these are probably minimum estimates in some way of, of the thickness. But this whole area covered by the deposits uh, is about 30 square kilometers, which interestingly was the same as the Twin Lakes eruption. So I don't know, I've got the magic number there, I guess. Um, the surges do not occur everywhere. So all of the little circles that have a star are, are holes that I dug where I found the surge deposits. And the thing to remember about surges, they don't go up in the air and then rain down. They flow over the ground and they're going to flow in the low lying areas. So this wall was there. I mean, the glacier carved out that steep sided wall. So the surges simply could not get up and over that thing. Instead, they hung a right and follow, follow these low lying areas and out through this little neck here and then out to the flats. Um, but the surges did travel about 
six kilometers or so from the vent. And this is a, a hazard that we need to be aware of and how far can these things travel? How common are they in these types of eruptions? In the Cascades, we have a lot of water. So it's reasonable to assume we might have that sort of eruption again. Um, so the deposits overall, again, covered about 30 square kilometers, but volume wise, this was a pretty small eruption. So we calculated a volume of about 0 0.04 cubic kilometers. Uh, that's similar to cinder cone in Lassen, California, but way smaller than Pericotine. The newest estimates for Pericotine are about 1.8 cubic kilometers, so much smaller than, than the nine-year eruption. So this was probably much shorter um, in its duration. So same plot for magma storage using melt inclusions for Blue Lake. So here's our CO2 and water. Um, the difference with Blue Lake is it seems like most of the crystals really formed at a constant um, pressure. So focusing mainly on these guys here, these uh, filled symbols, all of the water contents are about three and a half to four and a half weight percent water and about a thousand ppm CO2. It's pretty constant. So that suggests a, a fairly consistent storage depth of about um, 235 megapascals or about eight and a half kilometers. So it seems like that's where the magma stalled and sort of cooled a little bit before it erupted. Um, the last thing I'm going to go into are magma ascent time scales, and just want to illustrate again how important it is to know how much time we have before an eruption starts. Uh, this is a picture of the Cumbre Vieja La Palma area before the eruption. So this is May 21 of 2021. Seismicity started about this time, um, but then it kind of calmed down and didn't pick up again until September, and the eruption started in late September. By December 15th, same satellite image, same area, this is what it looked like then. So we really need to understand that, that time scale of run up. So the way I've done this for Blue Lake um, is through diffusion time scales. And so I've done this with a, knowing the fact that water likes to be in equilibrium and that water degasses from magmas as they ascend to the surface. So like when you take the top off your soda bottle, the gases go out. When magma starts to rise to the surface, what was once dissolved in the melt forms bubbles and tries to escape. So that's sort of the principle behind this. And I'm gonna walk through kind of a, a cartoon showing how this works. So here's time one, eight kilometers depth, my Blue Lake magma storage region. I have this little olivine crystal, it trapped a bit of melt and that melt has four weight percent water. It grew from a magma that has four weight percent water. Everything's in equilibrium and happy and just hanging out there, life is good. When that crystal starts to rise to the surface after that magma decides to start ascending, the water is going to leave the external melt, but it can't leave the melt inclusion because it's trapped. So now we have a situation where we're starting to have disequilibrium between the internal melt inside my olivine crystal, still 4 weight percent water. Now, say at four kilometers depth, that magma surrounding my crystal only has three weight percent water. So there's a disequilibrium between the water contents of those two. As ascent continues, by the time you get to about a kilometer beneath the surface, a magma, a basaltic magma is only gonna be able to hold about one weight percent water in it. So now the disequilibrium between those two is huge and the desire for these two to re-equilibrate is very high. So the principle behind getting ascent timescales is if ascent is slow, we know hydrogen can diffuse. This has been determined experimentally. It can diffuse pretty fast. We know the rate at which it diffuses. So if ascent is slow enough, water in here, hydrogen, is going to diffuse from my melt inclusion through the olivine crystal and try to re-equilibrate with the surrounding melt. If ascent is fast, there's not enough time for hydrogen to diffuse. And so we can figure out those time scales. Okay, what would be the, the fast time scale needed to keep my hydrogen inside of my melt inclusion. And in the case of Blue Lake, because there's so little variation in my water contents, I can constrain that pretty well. So here are the results um, of those models. So what I'm just showing on the bottom is the time and days for that crystal to ascend to the surface to preserve the water that I see in my melt inclusion, or for it to lose a little bit of water compared to what I see in my melt inclusion. The bottom line is ascent rates are rapid. So almost all of my crystals, so this is time and days, so this is like hours to one day, almost every single crystal I analyzed at a time scale of less than a day from eight and a half kilometers to get it up to the surface. 
Many of these melt inclusions had time scales less than three hours, and that corresponds to ascent rates of about one to 13 meters per second. So when I first did this, I thought, oh my gosh, that's not right. Like I must've done something wrong. This seems way too fast. That's really bad news. So I started compiling other estimates from other um, basaltic cinder cones from all over the world. And it turns out Blue Lake plots smack in the middle of all the other estimates. So Sunset Crater in Arizona, now the ascent rate is on the x-axis. So fast ascent rates, 10 to 100 meters per second, down to much slower ascent rates. But Sunset Crater, Arizona, Fuego, Guatemala, Eiffel Volcanic Field in France, Kilburn Hole in New Mexico. Here's the range for Blue Lake. Here's Pericotine, Auckland Volcanic Field. The only thing that doesn't have overlapping ascent rates is that some uh, Chilean cinder cones in the Andean volcanic zone. So the bottom line is these are totally reasonable and seem to have been documented for a lot of cinder cone systems. So ascent rates of 0 0.01 to over 30 meters per second are fairly normal for these systems. And that equates to ascent durations of, you know, 15 hours to an, less than an hour. So the, the kind of the takeaway for me is, boy, we could have very little time from when this magma decides it's going to rise to the surface to when it actually makes it to the surface. Okay, so to summarize in a cartoon way what we learned about Blue Lake, uh, the magma stalled and it cooled and crystallized at about 8.6 kilometers depth, hung out there for a little while. Once it decided to rise to the surface, it ascended very rapidly, probably less than a day. As it ascended, it hit probably a, the water table in the area. There's a spring that currently feeds Blue Lake Crater at a depth of about 78, um, 78 feet below the surface of the lake. So it could have been that was always there. And that is what the magnet interacted with. That explosion excavated the crater that we see today and produced these clouds of surge deposits. And finally, that uh, contact with the external water ceased and the the eruption was just sort of a purely magmatic sort of cinder cone forming explosive eruption. Okay, so that is everything. I want to extend huge thank you to all the people who helped me in the field. Here's Danielle McKay, who is a help, uh, an organizer of COGS, and that is her helping me dig pits at <laughs> Blue Lake, yeah. along with all of these people who helped me dig pits at Blue Lake. And many thanks to folks at, at CBO and the USGS who helped me with the PMAG work. Happy to take questions. Hi, so this is Paul. Awesome. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so much good stuff. Um, so I'm really new to looking at monogenetic stuff, so I don't know if this is a silly question, but I know you were talking about um Paracutine and how yeah. it grew really rapidly and it kind of reached its main size in about three months or so. Yeah but then erupted for nine years. Yes. Um, so I actually did my master's degree in Flagstaff. And so I know the, the cinder cones out there because I my research is in the Cascades <laughs> now, the cinder cones out there are gigantic. Yeah. Like I can't- Sunset is it. similar, yeah. Yeah, well, there were some that we looked at for a volcanology field trip with like Colton Crater and stuff. Oh, and yeah. Huge. It's so cool. I don't know if this is something that is known, but is there some sort of correlation with- either eruption, um, like length or mm -hmm. mechanisms or, but and size. there's also a, a yeah. compositional difference there. Those are, those cones are much more alkaline going through really thick carbonate rich crust, really. Yeah. Awesome question. Stuff. Yeah. I'm, I just started working in the San Francisco with a, a grad a postdoc. It's, it's yeah, cool. it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There are places, especially um, the one that comes to mind is the Auckland volcanic field where the mm -hmm. crust is really thin and there, there's a really good correlation with eruption <laughs> size and the amount of mantle partial melting. So they can actually say like everything that, you know, the mantle partially melted by this much, and that's basically what comes out. So the volume erupted did correlate with mantle melting. In a, I mean, I think to first order, there is a pretty good correlation with, I, um, Kathy Cashman has a figure on this. I don't know if she's ever published it, with like total mass erupted correlates with kind of longevity and development of a, a storage system. That's true for Pericotine and Haruyo, these longer lived eruptions, they got really a lot more evolved over time because they developed this shallow 
storage chamber. Blue Lake didn't have that. It really didn't change its composition at all either. It just came from the depth and shot to the surface. So there does seem to be a correlation with volume of stuff, formation of a shallow storage, and then more melt evolution. Um, but yeah, each field is so different because the crust does play a huge role. You're totally right. That's and really for Colton, it is a phreatomagmatic eruption, which is why its crater is just so ginormous. Oh, so it goodness. ended, it started out as a cinder cone, and then it ended with this phreatomagmatic phase and blasted out that, that big crater. That makes sense. Yeah, it's cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, earlier on, you showed uh, several photographs of phreatic eruptions in progress, but uh, at least two of them were under the, under the ocean, and one was very close. Are there any um, modern examples of a place where somebody observed a mar or a tuff ring being formed on a, just inland somewhere? Yeah, that's and Ukenrek, the Alaska example. And that the, we nobody was there when the Mars were uh, formed, but they came in, you know, the photo that showed that plume of stuff coming off of East Ukenrek Mar. Folks flew in from Alaska to, to observe the eruption. So I don't think anybody was nearby when the actual like phreatomagmatic explosion happened that created the crater. You wouldn't want to be super nearby for that, but that was a documented like nothing to Mar crater eruption mm -hmm. on land. I'm going to insert uh, somebody from the Zoom okay. audience. Um, so Charlie, can you hear me? Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Regard, um, well, the first one was answered by Marcia Nadel saying that there's a whole bunch of volcanoes up in British Columbia correlating to the Juan de Fuca plate. So that's fine. But I was wondering is you got these crystals forming down by the mantle and then forming again some more growing in the uh, whatever reservoir eight kilometers down beneath the ground. Um, do you find growth rings or can you, you have the seed crystal and then you start, uh, we'll have a certain amount of radioactive elements and the crystal will then grow bigger and it'll, as it grows, it starts catching some of the uh, dissolved water or whatever. But can you age across these crystals and just get a, a, a age, how do they grow? Because Yeah, I mean, you can get relative ages for olivine. There, I mean, in, in our cases and a lot of basalts, these things are fully molten. We don't have any mantle-derived minerals in our samples. Um, and the crystallization of at least Blue Lake and Twin Lakes actually doesn't seem to start in earnest until that 7 to 11 kilometers. So we don't have a record of deeper crystallization with respect to the stuff we've analyzed so far. You can see really cool zoning in the plagioclase and in the olivine, and you can get relative ages. So you can say, oh, well, this deeper zone was the first one to crystallize and its composition is you know, different than the rim of that same crystal. So I can kind of see how the crystal composition and, the, and then the melt composition was changing over time. But um, at least in these systems where the stuff's so young, there's nothing datable in olivine. Folks do do it in older systems where you have like a zircon included, or if you can actually date zones in a feldspar that's old enough, you can get actual ages for different growth rings. Yeah, cool. that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I wanted to ask for his question. Uh, he asked if there's any Mars close by that might look. I, on my Columbia Gorge trip, I always stop at the famous one up at the upper end of the Dow, where the Columbia and the salt quantums float into some sort of body of water. Deep oh, yeah. Because you've got nice filling. Mm -hmm. And then the Luston Point was there with Paul Hammond. And uh, that's a good example of, uh, of lava flowing into a continuing source of cold water that comes over from basically uh, map defiance. Mm -hmm. And uh, those two are a pretty good example of different water bodies that. The neat thing about uh, Ruthven is it has volcanic, fractured volcanic bombs with glass on the outside. Yeah, there's like hyaloclastite out there, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's bombs, somehow, mm -hmm. uh, broken bombs, and I always stop there. And then the the glass, of course, you know, oxidizes really fast. So you have to, but you can always find some real volcanic glass stuff that forms on the outside of the pillars. Yep. And you have to watch out for the 
trucker chief. <laughs> yeah. Great place to park. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you were working in uh, Poutine. Uh, you said it was well documented. Mm -hmm. Your PhD research, did you uncover something different or how did that go? Yeah. So uh, when I was working there, we were re examining the water and CO2 sulfur and chlorine contents of the melt inclusions. Um, so we found, well, a lot of advances have come out of Precotine, even since I worked there during my PhD. Um, when it was documented, I mean, they were getting basic bulk compositions and documenting eruption styles and cone growth and lava flow growth and all, I mean, they did a, a fantastic job. Coming back later and looking in detail, we discovered that the tephra layers, if you sample all the way from the base to the top, record a lot more variation in melt composition than you get just from looking, say, at bulk lava flows. Um, and we also found that there is there was a more primitive initial magma out that you just miss in the lavas. It didn't erupt as a lava. It was only as an initial tephrafall deposit. It had higher water and was more mafic. And now, since we've been there, there have been a couple of groups going down there doing a lot of radiogenic isotope work, and they have showed that it is a mess. There are multiple magma batches that were tapped kind of over time, and it, it really is a much more complicated system than we ever appreciated even. But it's super cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did some work with Paul up in the Indian heaven area. Oh, yeah. And I just wondered if uh, you did any correlation between that volcanic field and the trend down. Yeah. Way towards the you know, in the morning. Do any correlation that? Yeah, I've been making, uh, not in this one, but it, I've been doing a long arc compilation of sort of basalts from monogenetic volcanoes erupted throughout the Cascades. And Indian Heaven is super interesting because it has this much more back arc intraplate like signature. And interestingly, Twin Lakes has a similar signature that very low water content has higher alkalis, has high K2O, high titanium, higher niobium. So I'm interested in it for that reason is like, what is this sort of um, alkalic composition that's coming into the arc? Have you been to Long, long View for Long Rock? I don't no, I haven't. Okay, it's just beautiful. It's crazy hill complex. It's, it was I erupted under a glacier. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it, when it got to the glacier uh, depth, it formed a very long blob of major rocks. Me. I'll take you there. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. So I've seen yeah. red hot lava yeah. and lava flows and stuff like that. What is the consistency of these flows when they hit the surface? Uh, of like a surge deposit, you mean? Yeah. Uh, they are, I mean, it's like a pyroclastic density current. It's a cloud. So oh, they're, wow. it's a cloud that's sort of ground hugging, hot, gaseous with mobilized ash and fragments in it. So, so it's it, not like mud, it's, it's like gas. No, and they, I mean, they, yeah. depending on how much water is in them, they can almost be muddy. Um, at Twin Lakes, I found a section of surges where they have mud cracks in them. They were, they had so much external water in them that they cracked after they formed and formed mud cracks. So they can be really fluid, but they are flowing, you know, kind of like a, a dilute pyroclastic density current and of a much smaller volume. So we'll take another question from yeah. the Zoom audience. So Carrie, you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? You bet. And actually, I've got two questions. Emily, excellent talk. Thank you very much. I'm calling in from Prineville, Oregon. So I'm oh, sort cool. of in that neighborhood of the cinder cones. So first question, I think is, I think I know the answer. But you had a nice little string of cinder cones heading off to the east from Newberry. I'm assuming those are associated with the Brothers Fault Zone then? Uh, off in of that, Newberry itself. Of first images. What's that? It was in one of your first images showing the cinder cones and oh, the density. Yes. And a nice in the map streak view. that was wandering off to the east. Kind of yeah. looked like it was headed out to the high plains. Uh, not that one. Yeah, this one. So mm -hmm. this is sort of high lava plain. No, so there's fault that, zone yeah, that. Um, when you look at Newberry, I mean, all of this stuff is the that's the northwest rift zone coming off of Newberry going out to the um, 
like the cinder cones along 97 there. Is that what you were asking about? I think that might have been the image. Yeah, I mean, Newberry's, yeah. and you're right, Newberry's super complicated because the because the Brothers Fault Zone intersects the arc right about there, and you have this sort of trend of mafic volcanism that continues well off beyond Newberry, sort of on this trajectory out into eastern Oregon. Yeah. Yeah, that was the one I was looking at. Uh, but the actual, the other question, and this is just something I just, uh, having worked as a mineral material person for the Forest Service, I dealt with a lot of cinder cones, both actually down on the Coconino in Arizona, and then most recently, the last 30 years up here, we came across some cinder cones that are rootless, and it looks like the scoria has rafted north with the lava flow. Yes. So is that closer to Lake Billy Chinook. So have you observed some of these same types of cinder cones? Yeah, I've seen them also in the San Francisco volcanic field. Um, that happens very frequently in high flux eruptions. So the scoria cone builds up and then the lava flow comes out the bottom. This happened at Pericutine too, and Harillo. And if the lava flux of that flow coming out the bottom is fast enough, it's going to tear the cone apart. It, it, the, the cone <laughs> material is pretty loose. And so it just pulls one side of the cone and it rafts that tephra exactly as you said, right off with it. And then the cone rebuilds as it keeps having explosive eruptions. So I think to your point earlier, yeah, Pericutine grew up to its final height quickly, but then it fell apart and then it blew up and you know, grew up again. Um, where is it? Four craters out in central Oregon, kind of near Fort Rock, has some really awesome rafted tephra. But yeah, the San Francisco volcanic field has loads of cones that are just torn apart by their own lava flows. Thank you. I, yeah, I sure. excavated a lot of this. The material sources south of, of Flagstaff, and, and you get to a point because we didn't have me to drill. And I'd get to the point where, well, wait a minute, I just dropped into solid basalt. What yeah. the heck <laughs> happened? <laughs> So yeah. thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, for our local boring volcanics, I'm kind of wondering what they looked like before they were hit by the Missoula floods. But also, yeah. how often is it the case that, um, that monogenetic volcanoes are co connected to uh, extensional topography, like what we have with these? Very, Missoula. very frequently. Yeah. And so, I mean, in central Oregon, that's the case. So right about where we start to see that um, uptick in monogenetic volcanism in the central Cascades, that's where we have the high Cascades Graben. So the arc is getting pulled apart <clears throat> east-west, and we also have the Brothers Fault Zone and extensional stuff coming in from, from the east. So all of that extension is probably facilitating that. In Mexico, same thing, where Pericotine and Jerullo are, it's a funny part of Mexico where you go from the big volcanoes Popo and Ista, and then there's this extensional part where all the cinder cones are. Um, so it, it does seem to be fairly common. I mean, for basalt to get to the surface, you kind of need to help it a little bit because it's such a dense magma. So in that case, and in many cases, yeah, you need some faults to, to help provide pathways to the surface. Twin Lakes is located along a fault system. There are a lot of north-south trending faults out near Mount Bachelor. That Bachelor alignment of cones is also on one of these north-south things. So yeah, lots of faulting volcanism interaction. That yeah. Robin, that was a river, uh, uh, extension of Robin. That Robin is the result of the, the volcanic subduction being basically trapped by the hatch on the Fairlawn or whatever. It's then rebounding and it's trapped up against the uh, the blues and the high land plain. Yeah, I'm not that and far, not that far north, but like I, in the I, sort I of say, Robin. Just like a just like a rock arch going up and down the the uh, Columbia River, right? You put more county volcanism that is very previous to sessions, you know, the Western Cascades and stuff. And they're just stacked in there. And so that's not an extension of no, but this part is like the the area around sisters, the high cascades grub in here between about Jefferson and um, Newberry in that stretch is definitely point being pulled apart by the outer block, coast block rotation the that's age pulling it. The, the age of the extensions from the basin and range decrease all the way from Yopoho into, mm -hmm. into uh, uh, 
the three systems. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I suspect that some of that extension hitting the arc there is contributing to all of this 14 ka stuff that's those all those north south faults that are clearly popping out around that time and all these many systems that are active about that time window something's got to be driving all that well i think it's the driving mechanism based in the range because you can measure yeah. the time yeah yeah oh yeah i mean you've got lots of extension intersecting the southern central to southern oregon yeah, around that time it's just like i do a trip comparing newberry to to uh uh Lizana. they're the same volcano just the uh the uh, basaltic member came out of the caldera walls there's absolutely no silver no basaltic material inside the crater of newberry except the red hill Rest of it is silica, just like the Radesa platform in the song. And you've got Williams Crater that's got the, the by nature, you know, the small kind mm -hmm. of just so it, it's really comparable. And the differentiation model that Hal Williams and Bacon talked about, I think it's kind of I don't know if it really really happened that way, although it looks like it did at the uh benefit. Yeah, I just have a very quick question. Where are you coming up with these uh, magmatic inclusions? Are they on the ground? Are they in the products of the the mountain inclusions? Yeah, let me show yeah, where picture do you again. find those? Because you show right. like the, that down in the magma chamber. On one of yeah, days. so I when I go out and sample, I'll find those beds of ash and scoria, and I'll chuck a bunch of it into a Ziploc bag. So I get each layer, I get a sample of it, puts it, put it in a Ziploc bag, take it back to the lab. I sieve it down to various size fractions and I pick crystals out of the usually about one to half millimeter size fraction and then the one to two millimeter size fraction. Yeah. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm basically just picking out as many olivine as I can find out of those size fractions. I put them in a little vial. Then I look at them under the scope and I look for the mountain inclusions. So okay. yeah, they're coming out of the like loose material that I've sampled from different layers. Yeah. I was curious on one uh about Panama Bay. I wonder if that's a mark. There are, yeah, there are phreatomagmatic explosions. They have there's like coral in the, the products of some of those eruptions. I haven't seen them in person, but I used to show those images in class because it was clearly erupting through shallow sea because there's there's yeah. coral bombs in the deposits. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Two more questions from Zoom. Okay. Can, sure. Can that? Okay. Uh, so Gary, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, this will be very, very basic. Um, it, my question is inspired by a volunteer gig that I recently did yesterday where I had the joy of uh, digging out an old composter. So I have very recent experience and rare experience about what it takes to dig a hole. After, <laughs> after you have dug a 1.5 deep meter hole and you've measured it, tagged it, photographed it, like a good golfer, are you required to fill in your divot? <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. And okay. this summer, I was actually at Sunset Crater with my postdoc. We dug a two and a half meter hole through the sunset deposits. It took all day and it was tiered. We had steps into it. I mean, this thing was engineered. It was gorgeous. <laughs> this huge rectangular pit, did all the measuring, all the photographing, and then you're like, oh, chuck it back in. And, you know, the filling in takes, I don't know, a tenth of the time of <laughs> digging it out. But yes. We you always do fill it in and we try to make it look as undisturbed as possible. A follow-up question is that do you then tag the area that you filled in, the hole that you filled in, so that if another person comes along uh, looking to sample, know. they'll know that that area is disturbed? Yeah, I hopefully it would be fairly obvious that it was disturbed once you start digging. But yeah, whenever we publish our sections, we always put lat longs for the holes so people don't go out and dig in the same spot. But we've been out there and dug and gone, eh, this looks reworked. We're going to move over here. So it is once you know what deposits look like and you're looking for that layering, if that layering is absent, you know you've got a problem and could have been another human or something else. 
you know, one last thought is that the next time you uh, are filling in a hole, perhaps you might want to consider bringing a mannequin along so you can just put that in there for the <laughs> next person to find. Somebody. <laughs> and uh, one more quick one. Uh, Jessica Hall says, Dana, Willis. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Uh, my my question is kind of maybe a little more esoteric. When you talk about ascent rates, I've I've done a little bit of work in diamondiferous kimberlites in the Canadian Shield, and obviously, I guess the the source for the kimberlites is probably much deeper. But they that there's the concept that the ascent rate is at a high enough velocity that the diamonds do not, re the carbon doesn't, it, they would break down if there is too long of a residency. And they're looking at vent speeds approaching supersonic or subsonic at yeah. the surface. Have you, have, you, have you had a chance to compare those two? Yeah, I looked into, I mean, the, the compositions that are thought to bring up that stuff are so different. They're so fluid. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they are very impressively fast. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. um, I work with diamond, uh, diamond synthesis and stuff. Diamond can be very stable at temperatures as long as it's not oxidizing. It does not graphitize as long as no oxygen or cattle, uh, uh, ferrocatalysts. Diamond will sit there very happily. So. Okay. No. Learn about that in our class. Diamonds. Yeah. Okay. I think it's it's nine o'clock now. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody online. Thank Appreciate you. it. I can see you now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. Upstairs, Scott and. Extend the invitation. If you want to hang around, sip a little bit of wine, sleep in. I'll give you all a